I'm Stuart Broadbent, Obsolescence Director of Alstom. I've been in the rail industry since 1977. I joined uh, GEC Traction in 1980. GEC became GEC Alstom and became uh, Alstom, who I now work for. Um, and I've been Obsolescence Director since 2012. Um, and I'm also director of the Institute, International Institute of Obsolescence Management. Uh, so firstly, let me tell you a little bit about Alstom. Alstom doubled in size at the beginning of February when we took over uh, Bombardier. Uh, we're now in the process of integrating uh, a company that has 75,000 employees worldwide in 70 countries and with over 250 sites and 17,500 engineers. Now the Bombardier name has to disappear because it's owned by Bombardier uh, for, their, for their business jets um, business. Um, so, so the future will simply be Alstom. Uh, the integration started at the beginning of February. Uh, the UK becomes a huge service market, um, or huge service business for the combined business. Uh, combining Alstom and Bombardier's uh, service business. So let me tell you about the basics of obsolescence management. So we have an international standard, IEC 62402. Um, uh, the, the most recent version is the 2019 version. And in the 2019 version, obsolescence is defined as the transition of an item from available to unavailable from the original manufacturer in accordance with the original specification. And we'll talk about what can become obsolete and the types of obsolescence that you can have. So we're not going to talk at all about planned obsolescence. Planned obsolescence is what happens in consumer industries where the, where the manufacturer wants to encourage you to buy a new version of their product by making their old one seem out of date or by modifying the latest, latest things like, um, like power connectors so that you can't use them with uh, the older versions. In the rail industry, we talk about two types of obsolescence. Functional obsolescence is where the item still operates as intended and can still be manufactured and supported, but it is no longer suitable for the current requirements or a new technology is preferred. So, for example, the change from analog to digital radio for communication between cab and, and signal box. Um, and of course, the change from 2G to 3G to 4G over time um, for data communications. Technological obsolescence is where the item is no longer available from or supported by the original manufacturer. And so, for example, in rail, you would see things like electronic control systems for the auxiliaries, brakes, doors, HVAC and traction, for power modules, uh, the power modules for auxiliaries and traction, passenger information systems and CCTV systems. So why does this happen? Well, it's simply that the technology life cycle between the components that we use and what we're expecting from the systems that we supply and, and use in rail are incompatible. So electronic components typically have a life cycle of three to five years. Uh, that, uh, that also applies to other types of commercial off the shelf components. The rail industry and similar long life cycle industries such as aerospace will use the components, electronic components from um, the consumer market, but have absolutely no influence over the life cycle of those components. So when the, when the mobile phone has to be smaller, cheaper, lighter, thinner, then the uh, electronic component manufacturers develop new versions and will make their, their older versions of microprocessors and memory chips uh, obsolete. In the middle, we've got the equipment where we're looking for at least a 10 to 15 year uh, life cycle. So emery cots means the, the, the catalog items uh, such as such as HVAC in that picture um, that come from the rail industry, which means that there is at least some understanding in the rail industry um, 
that, that the market is not three to five years, a replacement in three to five years, but a replacement in 15 years and, and hopefully much longer than that. And then also the rolling stock equipment, the, the traction power modules, the electronic control systems that are made by the rail manufacturers for their rolling stock. Um, and so we have to, we have to uh, manage the gap between the components that we buy and the, the life cycles that we're looking for in rail of 30 to 40 years. So what goes obsolete? Well, we all know about electronic components, electron, the electronic component life cycle is three to five years. The power of an electronic chip doubles every year. And, and so the chips that we used in the 1980s and 1990s simply are not made anymore. We also have materials and substances. In this case, uh, you can see an image there with lead free, with, uh, with solder in it. Leaded solder was the, was the standard until the beginning of the 2000s for all soldering. Uh, the EU and, and other authorities uh, decided that uh, leaded solder was, was dangerous and had to, be, had to be banned. And therefore, uh, leaded solder is now uh, difficult to, to get hold of and uh, is, is in the process of being being uh, being made obs being made obsolete and having to be replaced by other types of solder, and then we have mechanical and electrical parts. Perhaps the life cycle isn't isn't as short as that of, of electronics, but things like globalization, rationalization of catalogues, means there's nevertheless a drive to 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 make components um, obsolete. But we can also have obsolescence in test equipment. Test equipment will very often use a specific um, computer in it. Um, so you may, may well find that your test equipment uses Windows XP or Windows 7 when, when they are no longer supported by the manufacturer um, and everywhere else you've got uh, Windows 10. Software can be obsolete as well, not because you can't copy a piece of software and make an, uh, make multiple copies of it, but because, the, but because the hardware that it runs on and the operating systems that it requires to support it and the peripherals such as parallel ports and serial ports that it once used are no longer available. Um, and also to make a change to software, um, you, need to, um, you need to the original development test bench and the original development test bench may run on an obsolete operating system. Um, and therefore you're unable to compile a new version of the software. Processes also go obsolete um, and, and so uh, you may no longer be able to make something again as a result of um, things like uh, European Union uh, the REACH program um, on control of hazardous substances. Finally skills, so if you take an electronics engineer from the 1980s the Electronics engineer would have done both the hardware and the software of the equipment and would therefore know how to, to, to use the hardware to support the software. Today, hardware and software are completely separate. And therefore, if you need to support hardware from the 19 or electronic systems from the 1980s and 1990s, you need to find that scarce resource of the electronic engineer who knows both hardware and software. So obsolescence management is what we, what we do in order to uh, manage this gap between the, a, the life cycle of the components and the life cycle of the systems that they are in. So here we have again from the standard, we have a plan, do, check, act cycle for obsolescence management and a definition of obsolescence management, which is the coordinated activities to direct and control an organization with regard to obsolescence. And we'll have a look at this in a little bit more detail later on in the presentation. A starting point of obsolescence management is the risk assessment. Um, and in this case, uh, we start with the likelihood assessment. And this has been customized to meet the needs of the, the rail industry uh, in the case, in the way that Alstom use it. So, the likelihood assist assessment consists of two elements, an estimation of the number of years to the item becoming 
obsolete, 0 to 10 years, 10 to 20 years, or more than 20 years. And then the presence of factors that delay the impact of that obsolescence. So for example, a part may be uh, dual or multi-sourced. Um, it may be of a, a, a low technology that's easy to, um, easy to, to, to reproduce. Um, important point here is that the likelihood assessment is, it depends on the view of the person doing it or the view of their, of their organization. So a, a, a part designed and made by Alstom for which Alstom has the drawings would be would have a would have a low um, potentially a low likelihood of in, of obsolescence because Alstom has the drawings, which means it can take them to somebody else. Viewed from the operator or the asset owner, the the same the same part looks like a single sourced part from from one manufacturer, and therefore a much higher likelihood of um, obsolescence. So we then look at the impact assessment. So what's the criticality of the part um, to the function? Um, is it low, low, medium or high? Um, so a traction control system would clearly be, would be high. Um, some parts would be much lower to the, to, the, to the function of the system. And then we have the time to resolve, uh, to resolve the issue. Um, and that can include the necessity of, uh, necessity of validating uh, replacement for uh, the control system um, and and perhaps getting in doing on track testing and a new uh, safety case. So we bring those together uh, likelihood and impact to determine uh, the overall risk of obsolescence and therefore the, the the action that we're going to take. So for low risk we talk about a reactive approach and for high risk we talk about for medium and high risk we talk about a a proactive approach. So we've performed the risk assessment. Um, if we have a low risk and we have a therefore a reactive approach, we don't do anything till we till we get the obsolescence announcement because we know that we are able we will be able to resolve it within the within the necessary timescales. But if we have a medium or high risk of obsolescence, we take a proactive approach and we need to mitigate concerns of um, obsolescence and we particularly look at what we can do in the design phase to reduce the, the future risk or the future impact of obsolescence um, including um, such uh, such things as um, uh, modular design a technology transparency which means that you understand the interfaces between uh, the modules um, uh, characterization of the specification of, of materials. Um, if you buy a material to a data sheet um, today and it's a, it's a specific material by a particular manufacturer, if that manufacturer makes it obsolete, then the only thing that you have when you're trying to resolve that obsolescence is the data sheet of the original manufacturer. And you don't know which of the properties of the original material were the most important for you. So when you try to specify uh, a replacement material if you're not careful you have to specify a material which is the copy of the original material which has just been made obsolete because you don't know whether it was low temperature performance uh, humidity response uh, yield strength whatever it is type of material it is you don't know which was which actually mattered in the choice of the designer because the designer simply took a data sheet and, and used it Intell ip intellectual property management is also uh, important uh, software licensing um, it, and is a means of ensuring that the, that the software actually can be can be used throughout the, throughout the life cycle. So we have a number of ways of mitigating um, the concern, mitigating the risk of um, obsolescence, um, and these are documented in the um, international standard. So we then move through to receiving the obsolescence announcement and uh, we have various ways of re resolving obsolescence from simply the use of the existing stock that we already have perhaps making a lifetime buy of an electronic component finding substitutes for the component um, all the way down to redesign and you won't be surprised to know 
but redesign and reverse engineering is much more expensive than than some other than substitutes and equivalents and alternatives um, and therefore good planning is needed to avoid the need to do um, a major redesign um, when an obsolescence announcement comes along and surprises you. So we come back to the, um, the plan do check act diagram um, and, and now we talk about the obsolescence management plan. So this is where we take the um, end users requirements, the applications environment and the regulations. We take the obsolescence management policy of the organization and we develop an obsolescence management plan that will be used throughout the life cycle of the, of the product um, in order to manage uh, obsolescence. Uh, we implement obsolescence management activities as early as possible uh, in the item's life cycle. Uh, we look by good manufacturer selection, uh, identifying the critical items and, and good design practice. And then as we come in the, into the into the third uh, third quadrant, now we're monitoring and monitoring the availability of the components and that are used in the system uh, throughout the life cycle, so that we get so that we know, hopefully in advance, that um, there's going to be obsolescence and we have time to to um, work on it and find uh, resolutions. Um, and we can, when we then get an obsolescence. Uh, alert, uh, we can then um, act on that obsolescence using the information that we've already got from the obsolescence management plan to help us to do that. Uh, we, and so the obsolescence management plan is, is maintained throughout the life of the equipment um, and is reviewed periodically to ensure that it remains um, up to date. So in summary, Obsolescence management is the bridge between the short life cycle of components and the long life cycle of rolling stock. The obsolescence risk assessment allows the correct choice of obsolescence management strategy for each equipment within the system. High risk equipment requires a proactive strategy and good design practice can extend uh, the equipment life. The obsolescence management plan itself is the key to achieving uh, the planned life cycle of the equipment and avoiding premature withdrawal from service because of the difficulty of getting spare parts or, or modifying the system so that it, it can take, account, take um, account of the latest constraints and requirements of the operator uh, and, and service requirements. How to learn more about obsolescence management. Um, the International Institute of Obsolescence Management has has uh, chapters in Germany, India, United Kingdom and USA and the IOM chapters have regular member meetings currently online. Um, we have a, a biannual international conference where experts in obsolescence management come together. Um, this year uh, it's online on the 21st of May. Uh, you can find more information on the IOM website uh, which is www.theiom.org. And then in 2022, uh, we have our, our normal face-to-face uh, -face conference, which had been postponed from, from 2021. So IOM brings together people from different companies and different business sectors, allows them to work together and network together. It allows them to identify best practice in other companies and sectors, and it allows them to meet uh, and find out about obsolescence solution providers who, who are able often to, to resolve problems of obsolescence um, in, in various ways. IOM has accredited training providers in the UK and Germany who can deliver uh, a three-day short course in obsolescence management that leads to the AIOM uh, qualification.